And that, of course, is the classic Universal Monsters. And give it up. Let's give it up. Let's give it up. And when you talk about the classic Universal Monsters, it's impossible to have that conversation without talking about the work of Jack Pierce. Um, you know, Jack came up in a very different era. It was the studio system era. For quite a few of his films, most of his films, he wasn't even credited. It was before Academy Awards were given to makeup artists. And uh, he didn't really get the credit he deserved in life. So today what we're going to hope to do is take you through the career of Jack Pierce at Universal, not every single movie because there's so many of them. Uh, we've got a great panel today that's going to uh, join us and discuss his career. Um, we've assembled some of the biggest experts on Jack Pierce. And I'd like to start out by just asking uh, our individual panelists, you know, everybody comes to these films um, a certain way. So I want to, I'll start with Perry here and we'll go down the line. And just how did you discover the work of Jack Pierce? I've been a uh, monster kid since about age four or five, which was about the first time I saw a universal horror film uh, on television. I grew up in Los Angeles, so it probably been, probably been on Channel 5, who had the Universal Horror Library throughout the 60s and 70s and 80s. But um, one of the, I can't remember the exact first universal horror film I saw. It was either Man-Made Monster, Werewolf of London, or Claude Rains, Phantom of the Opera. And whichever one it was, uh, I was attracted to these films. You know, well, most of the kids are attracted to monster films generally because they just think they're so cool, especially when you're, you know, five, six years old, you're so intrigued uh, by them. But uh, the, just the, the pathos, the sympathetic quality of those uh, mo so-called monsters in the Universal films is what really drew me to those characters as a kid. And then maybe around age nine or ten, I discovered Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. I know this story is very, very familiar because we all share it. Many of us in this room could tell the exact same story. Um, so I'm not unique in that way, but this is how I came to know the work of Jack Pierce. I started buying books like Dennis Gifford's uh, uh, you know, Illustrated History of the Horror Film. Uh, these film history books that had photos, and then I, you know, like we all did, learned the name. We learned the names of these behind-the-scenes artists. So uh, probably around age nine or ten, I became aware of who Jack Pierce was. And my father, who used to watch these films with me, would, was a big fan of pointing out uh, people in the credits. And he'd always he used to be a laugh out of Vera West. I don't know why he thought that name was funny. Gowns by Vera West. And uh, then Jack Pierce's name occasionally would pop up on the credits. Not, a, not consistently, but that would just come. And then I just got, I got very intrigued by the makeups and the actors. And boom, it was just, you know, it's almost like I can't remember a beginning point because it's just been with me my whole life. So that's it. Excellent. Uh, the next gentleman on our panel here is Jeff Pirtle. I'm walking like Frankenstein today, by the way, guys, because I just had surgery on both foot. Uh, Jeff is uh, the director of Universal Archives and Collections. The studio is very gracious to lend Jeff to me today. So go ahead, Jeff, introduce yourself. And real quickly, because we've got a lot of stuff to get through today, tell us uh, how you came to know Jack Pierce. Sure. Uh, you know, growing up, you always know what Frankenstein looks like, what the bride of Frankenstein looks like. And I think I was even Frankenstein a couple times for Halloween growing up as a kid. And I've been at Universal for the last 10 years. and. I hate to admit it, but I really didn't know the name Jack Pierce until I started working at Universal and really had an opportunity to delve into the archives and really understand his genius and to note that this one man created so many iconic characters in Universal's library is just overwhelming. So I'm a relative newbie to the uh, genius of Jack Pierce. All right, now next we have Mike Hill, and if you guys uh, haven't been out to the main building, if you've been there, you definitely know the work of Mike Hill. He's an amazing sculptor, and this year he did that incredible Jack Pierce that's sitting out there. And, and uh, Mike, how'd you come to the Universal Monsters of Jack Pierce? Well, I didn't really have the luxury of famous monsters back in England, back in the early 70s. So I just get fleeting glimpses of these guys in the local newspapers when they, it was announced that the movie was going to be shown on TV. And um, when I was like six years old, I finally got the same book that Perry mentioned. It's a Dennis Gifford book, and it's called, it was a horror film, it's a horror film, yeah. Beautiful cover. And I actually thought Jack Pierce was in every movie. Because as a, a five-year-old, or six-year-old, every at Frankenstein with Jack Pierce, the Wolfman with Jack Pierce. So I think, wow, this guy's in every movie, is really popular. 
So this time went by, I realized, no, no, this, this is a man who made this stuff. And um, apart from, I mean, like all of us here, you know, I got fixated by the, the square-headed monster and the wolfman around Talos Pathos. And again, I think it was, you know, I'm sure I'm going to delve into it, but it was the humanity that Jack put into the work that, you know, when we later see movies like Teenage Werewolf, you know, the character, no character behind it, but Larry Talbot and the Wolfman had character. So, um, again, I think it's the humanity that speaks to me. And um, over to Scott. This is Scott Esmond, um, foremost monster historian. Um, Scott, how'd you come by the Universal Monsters Jack Well, I'm probably loaded on the panel. I'm an East Coast guy. Any East Coast people here? <laughs> That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I came by the films through uh, channels like WPIX, you know, I'm the W guy, um, and uh, Metro Media Channel 5, and I watched the films. I'm guessing, now looking back, it was probably about 1973, 74, where I first started watching the films, seven, eight years old, and uh, it was a different book for me that coalesced all this stuff. Of course, I was monsters, but uh, Ed Naha did a book in 1975. You guys know it? Horrors from Screen to Scream. Raise your hand if you know that book. Great book. Go find it. It's uh, probably on eBay and places, but uh, Ed's still around and um, he might even be here at the convention. But that was a great book and it sort of illustrated all the, the films A to Z and it had great pictures and so forth. And, you know, many, many years later when I started researching makeup people and whatnot, I was shocked at how little there was about Jack Pierce. Um, of course, the uh, how to Make a Monster book had some stuff on him and the Naha book, but you know he doesn't even have a credit on Frankenstein. There's no makeup credit at all. They credit art direction, cinematography, sound, but no makeup. Isn't that amazing? On the original Frankenstein movie. And then I had done some other research things and sort of found out, you know, there's nothing out there on this guy. There had never been a book made about Jack Pierce, not a proper documentary. Um, you know. This isn't to cast this version on Universal, but if you go on the back lot tour, there's a Bud Westmore building, there's no Jack Pierce building. So, you know, when when I saw how little had been done on him and how iconic his images are, I started to really, you know, love this guy and, and all the great work that he did. Um, you know, not only um, the great monster films, but just all the stuff he did at Universal at that time, you know. But, you know, when you think of the Wolfman, the Frankenstein monster, the Bride, Igor, the Mummy, these things haven't been topped. And it's what, almost, you know, for, for a lot of it, it's 80 years later, 70 years later, for the Wolfman. They haven't outdone them, right? So that's how I came into it, just because he was he had done such great work but was so unknown um, in large circles. You know, you say to people, Jack Pierce, they don't know what you're talking about, and then you show them a picture of the Frankenstein monster, and they'll immediately say, incorrectly, Frankenstein. Hmm. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, right? So they know the work, they just don't know the person who did it all. I thought that was sort of a shame, so that's how I got into it. I'm John Murdy, I'm creative director of Universal Studios Hollywood, specifically uh, Halloween Horror Nights. And uh, <laughs> uh, I certainly would not be doing what I'm doing today if it wasn't for Jack Pierce. Uh, my mom made the mistake of showing me Frankenstein when I was four years old. And uh, real quick, the story is, you know, she came back in and I was crying my eyes out. She thought, oh my God, I've traumatized my son. <laughs> Which she probably did, but uh, I was I was crying not because I was scared of the monsters. I was crying because I felt such sympathy for them. Because when you look at a movie like Frankenstein, the real monsters are the are the guys with torches, you know, chasing them around, and he's just trying to find where he belongs in that film. So I was hooked from that moment on, and, and I started Universal in '89, and I spent the better part of my career um, trying to keep the name of Jack Pierce alive. And what we're going to do today is we're going to start out with the very, very, very beginning, how Jack Pierce got noticed and came to Universal. And I'm going to ask Scott real quick to tell that story. We're going to start with a movie called The Monkey Talks. Right here. Yeah, so Pierce had done this at Fox. Um, he had been working as an actor and a stuntman and an assistant director and, you know, played a bad guy in films in, in the silent era. And... Uh, from about 1916 to 1924, that's what he did. He worked on all these films. And then he decided, you know what, the acting thing isn't going to work out. And uh, he had tried to be a baseball player, most people don't know that. But he was pretty small for an athlete. He was, you know, 5'6", and pretty slight. 
So the athletics that work out and the acting that work out and so forth. He had all, one, one other thing that he did in the early years, he did a little of everything, but he managed movie theaters for Harry Culver, the founder of Culver City. So he was like his main movie theater manager. Isn't that interesting? So he did everything he could to get into the business, right? You know, everything except get the coffee. But um, at a certain point, he decided, you know what, the, the makeup is what I'm really good at, and that's what I'll stick to, and I'll give up doing makeup on myself. Because, you know, back then, actors did their own makeup. There wasn't anything like a makeup artist in the earliest silent years, right? We're talking, you know, 1910 to mid-1920s. So they did their own makeup. That's how all these guys got started, Pierce, but also Lon Chaney, right? He did all of his own makeups. and. Uh, Oh, always did, of course, and then the uh, guy at MGM, Jack Don, who ended up doing the Wizard of Oz. So they did their own makeups, and Pierce eventually said, you know, the acting thing isn't going to work out, so I'll switch to um, just doing makeup full-time on other people. And this was one of the first big projects he got.